student chapters in Pakistan um, since last month's call. So if you're new, welcome. The format of this call is in just a couple minutes, I'll be introducing our guest speakers who were, um, I think you're gonna be really, really interested in what they have to say. Uh, hopefully there'll be time for some uh, questions in the chat after their opening comments. Uh, after that, I'm gonna go over some of the things that have happened since last month's call and go over what we're gonna be doing and then I have a special treat for you at the end of today's call, so make sure you don't drop off. The most important thing I wanna let you know though today is that on November 6th, uh, we will be having midterm elections. The first day that Congress will be in business after that is November 13th. We will be on the Hill that day for Congressional, Congressional Education Day. So Congressional Education Day is open for registration. If you wanna to come to DC with us, that's gonna be November the 12th and 13th. And we'll probably be the first organization that has a lot of access to Congress right after the midterm election. So that will be the first day they're back in session and we will be on the Hill and we wanna see as much of the Congress as we can. I'll get into that a little bit more later. Um, so our two speakers today, uh, oh, and also let me just say, for those of you who are marching right now and you're listening to the recording, thank you for marching today. That's also important. So for those of you who had to listen to the recording because you're marching, thank you for marching today. That is important and we're really pleased that you can do that. So our two guests, Lee, Lee Van Boven, who has a PhD from Cornell and David Sherman, who has a PhD from Stanford, um, are social psychologists, and one of the areas that they've been published in is in the area of partisanship. And that is really, really interesting to us. So there's, there's a couple things that I want to um, let both of you know about the people who you're talking to. One is, they're not gonna listen to what you're saying casually. They're not gonna listen like, oh, wow, now I've got a piece of information so I can win an argument with my brother-in-law. They don't wanna do this because they have a little bit more in their vocabulary. The way they listen is more like, you know, a lot of us have been on airplanes and they always give you the warning, like if something happens, here's what you do. They listen like the pilot already said the plane's on fire and I better make sure I'm hearing what I need to hear so that I can land safely. So these people are going to take this very seriously and are, are interested in being effective with the information you'll be sharing with us. The other thing I wanna tell you about them is I wanna share our new homepage because I think this really reflects uh, who we are as an organization. This just went up yesterday and everybody will always have access to the iconic picture um, of the people standing on the Capitol steps. But our homepage now says, if you're listening, if you can't see the screen, our solution to climate change, democracy. I think for Leslie and the marketing team that put that together, that's probably the purest expression of what we have been trying to do as an organization. So thank you for sharing that, uh, Ricky. So that's up and you can, all, you can all see that today. Okay, so uh, Lee Van Boven and David Sherman um, uh, had an op-ed in the New York Times a few weeks ago um, elaborating on their paper about uh, partisanship and how we work effectively in a, in a partisan world. Um, we're glad that we have people who are expert in this area. You know, everybody has an opinion about it, but they're both actual experts and we're really thrilled two of you could make yourself available on a Saturday. Uh, and again, after opening remarks, uh, hopefully we'll have some time for some Q&A and thank you so much both for your work and making yourself available today. Great, thank you. Um, Leif, are you going to uh, show, the, show the slides? Yes, I'm going to um, share my screen so that I can um, show you our slides. Let's see. Okay, does this look right to everyone? David is. Yeah, yep. it looks great. Mark, okay, great. Okay, well, well, thank you, Mark. Uh, and thank you everyone for being here. It's really exciting to join you. Um, there's a very nice symmetry in this meeting. Um, so uh, the leaders of CCL invited Leif and I to this webinar um, because of our New York Times op-ed, which was based on an article that we published earlier this year in the journal Perspectives on Psychological Science. And while we were working on that article, which was a several year process, uh, we read about the work of CCL in a May 2017 article in the New York Times. And it, we featured it in our piece uh, as an example of how some of the psychological barriers to climate policy could be transcended. 
So we want to thank you all for uh, reaching out for us and we hope that our research is informative and useful. Okay, and so we're, David and I are going to tag team a little bit. Um, and so I think that was the tag, it's now coming uh, back to me. So what we would like to do is, is actually tell you some of the details um, about the, the social psychological research that really form the basis of this op-ed that, that we wrote. And so we're gonna walk through the, the de some of the details of, uh, of a large scale um, survey and experiment that we conducted uh, in 2014 with a, with a replication then again in, in uh, 2016. So one of the questions we were particularly interested in is understanding just what exactly is the sort of the, the distribution of belief and um, concern about climate change. So we conducted a national survey with about a thousand respondents that was um, approximately representative of, of the United States. And we provided to people as part of the survey, a very brief description of um, of what climate change is, what, what causes climate change, that carbon emissions um, contribute to climate change, and um, that climate change contributes to uh, extreme weather events and obviously to uh, is reflected in global warming. So we then asked people how much they personally agreed with four different statements about climate change. So one was simply that climate change is happening, Another is that uh, human activity has contributed to climate change, um, that climate change poses a threat to uh, humans, and that reducing carbon emissions um, would help mitigate climate change. So we asked people their agreement with each of those four statements on a scale that ranged from negative three on the disagree side to positive three on the agree side. Now, we then took those agreement uh, responses and average them together. It turns out that those responses are all very closely correlated. So we average those four responses together. And what we have plotted here are density plots that represent the distribution of Democrats in blue, uh, independents in purple, and Republicans in red along the distribution of this scale of belief in climate change. So there are a couple of things that are really important to, to notice in, in this graph. So first of all, let's just acknowledge there are some partisan differences here. So the Democrats are, are stacked up over on the right, over on the agree side of the scale. And clearly Democrats agree more strongly than do independents and Republicans that climate change is a concerning reality. The broader point, however, is that the majority of all three of these groups are on the agree side of the scale. So even though Republicans are not as strident in their agreement and recognition that climate change is a concerning reality, about 70% of Republicans are above the midpoint of the scale. Um, and about 90% of Democrats are above the midpoint of the scale. Now, it is also true that you can sort of work with these numbers to, to frame them in a way that really highlights the partisan difference. So if you ask a question, who is skeptical about climate change? In this case, we mean who's on the negative side of the scale. It's true that there are many, many more Republicans who are skeptical of climate change. In fact, among uh, skeptics, about 70% of the skeptics are Republicans and only about 15% of the skeptics are Democrats. But that misses, again, this broader point that the skeptics are a distinct minority of the overall distribution of each of the three groups. So even though it's true, that most skeptics are Republicans, the more sort of substantive truth is that most uh, Republicans are not skeptical. They recognize the reality of climate change just like most Democrats and independents. So there is broad evidence for widespread belief in climate change among these three partisan groups. This is a pattern that we replicated in a study in 2016 conducted right before the election. We've seen similar patterns in recent data from the Pew organization and also from a large scale study called the American National Election Study. But in a sense, we're ultimately interested in understanding not just belief in climate change, but support for climate policy that is translating these beliefs in climate change into action. 
And so at this point, I'm going to turn it back over to David. Okay, so um, as, uh, as Leif said, um, belief in climate change, uh, which here is on the x-axis, um, is not necessarily enough to lead to action. Uh, in this case, what's on the y-axis, which is support for carbon pricing policies. And a lot of uh, psychological science and political efforts have been uh, trying to change what's on this x-axis, trying to change people's beliefs. But as you can see, there are many people who believe um, those who are above zero in the belief, but yet don't support the, the carbon uh, pricing policy, that is, are in the negative uh, side of the, of the y-axis. So why is that? And that's been one of the main questions that's been motivating our research. Well, it's important to recognize that changing beliefs in climate change may happen slowly, uh, but the more important question is to ask how can we make the large number of people who already believe uh, how can we kind of get them to act in accordance with these beliefs? It's kind of like getting people who believe that it's important to eat in a healthy way to actually eat healthy. How can you cross that belief action uh, divide? Because what matters much more is what is on the y-axis, that is actual behavior or support for policies, not changing beliefs per se. So if you could go to uh, the next slide, uh, Leif. Okay, so to understand uh, policy support, it's obviously important to see who is proposing uh, the policy. Um, currently, uh, climate policy has become a way for Republicans to differentiate themselves from Democrats. And as, as you know, historically, environmental issues have been more bipartisan and have had bipartisan support. So in our experiment, we presented a revenue neutral carbon tax policy to uh, the participants. Um, it followed several of the proposals made by conservative proponents that would tax carbon emissions, uh, thereby incentivizing firms to reduce emissions. And this would be offset by a tax swap to reduce overall taxes. So revenue neutral carbon tax policy. And we told the participants in one condition that it was backed by Democratic politicians in Congress and opposed by Republicans. And in the other condition, uh, that it was backed by Republicans and opposed by Democrats. Now, as you can see, if you look at this uh, figure, um, the independents in the middle, they weren't affected by the uh, manipulation of who proposed the policy. But the partici partisan participants towed the party line. So looking first, or looking next at the Republicans, um, you could see that the Republicans were neutral to the policy if Democrats proposed it and were favorable towards a policy if they believed that their fellow Republicans proposed it. By contrast, if you look at the Democrats, the Democrats were much more strong in their policy support when they believed that their fellow Democrats proposed the policy than when they believed that Republicans proposed the policy. Now, the other way uh, to look at this uh, figure uh, might suggest what would happen if Republicans actually proposed a policy. There's much less polarization among the red bars. Um, it, there's much more uniform support for the policy when Republicans proposed it. But the bars fluctuate widely uh, if you look at the blue bars when Democrats proposed the policy. Okay, so I think this is now back to me. Um, so David, described a pattern where people are somewhat sensitive to where the policy comes from, right? And this really is kind of the fundamental point that people evaluate policies, not because of what the policies are, but because of who the policies represent, because of, of where the policies come from. So another part of this experiment um, was designed to, to help us understand why are people swayed by these partisan considerations? And, and really the hope here is that if we can understand why this happens, then we can think about ways to intervene to kind of interrupt these, these partisan negative reactions. So a large part of why people are swayed by partisanship is that they believe their political peers are even more swayed by partisanship. So there's a lot going on in that statement. So let's um, unpack that in, in a little bit of detail. As part of this survey, we also asked people to estimate what the 
average Democrat would think of the, of the policy and to estimate what the average Republican would think of the policy. And here's what we found. So I think we can see this most clearly if we look over at the right, so these new bars that have appeared, the estimated average Republican. And I wanna point out two things here. So first of all, if you look at the difference between the blue bar and the red bar, that difference, which represents the kind of sensitivity to partisan framing, is much larger than the actual difference. So people think that their peers are much more swayed by this partisan framing than in fact uh, people actually are. And we see a similar pattern if we look all the way over on the left now, over at the estimated average Democrat, the difference between that blue bar and the red bar is much larger than the difference between the actual average Democrat. Okay, so that's the first point, that people think that their peers are much more swayed than they actually are. The second point, which, which really I think represents a, um, um, a key way of understanding what's happening here, is that where people are exaggerating these partisan differences is they exaggerate how much they think other people are going to react negatively to policy proposals that come from the other side. So let's look back over on the right at the estimated average Republican. Most people believe that Republicans would distinctly oppose a policy that comes from Democrats, even though in our survey, Republicans were actually on, on the neutral side. And we see a similar pattern for people's estimates of Democrats, that most of them believe that Democrats are going to be neutral, certainly not supportive of a policy that comes from Republicans, when in fact, Democrats are slightly on the supportive side of um, considering a policy that comes from Republicans. So people exaggerate how, how much their partisan peers will react negatively to policies from the other side. And it turns out that, that these estimates statistically explain almost all of the difference between Democrats and Republicans' reactions to um, policies that come from either Democrats or uh, Republican uh, uh, political leaders. So in other words, it looks as though the reason people respond in this partisan way is that they think their peers respond in a partisan way. And what people are worried about is violating the norm or the belief that most of their peers hold, not necessarily violating the, uh, the political leaders. So that, I think, starts to shed some light on exactly what these underlying processes are. And one of the things that, that um, we were most excited about in this research project was kind of going beyond these large scale surveys and, and conducting a couple of interviews to help shed additional light on the sort of political processes and how they interface um, with these types of partisan effects. And so I'm going to turn it back over to David now who will tell you about one of these interviews. Okay, so um, as Leif said, for the, in some ways, for the first time in our careers, we, we tried something a, a little bit different. Um, we told our, we discussed our findings with uh, experts in the field um, outside of academics. Uh, in this case, uh, th those were uh, a bipartisan group of retired members of Congress. Um, and we described for them our findings just as we described them uh, to you. And we want to see how their experience trying to advocate for bipartisan environmental policy may be similar or different from the types of uh, findings that we are seeing here with average citizens. So one of the uh, politicians who we spoke with was uh, Representative Bob Inglis. Um, and he told us a story that kind of resonated with the findings that, that we've just described. So he talked about giving a talk in Salt Lake City um, to a uh, Republican House uh, conference. And that there was a good deal of support uh, there because in Salt Lake City, um, as he says, there's this inversion problem and the air is bad. And so they want to solve environmental problems. So he talks about uh, the need for a carbon tax and, and uh, gives his talk. And then he calls for questions. And he's expecting perhaps hoping for an enthusiastic response, but there's no questions. And the reason is, he says, you know there's going to be a loud mouth in the crowd who's going to jump down the throat of anybody who raises his hand and outs themselves as believing in climate change. But privately, people say, 
yeah, yeah, we got to do something about that. So this loud mouth, uh, as he puts it, norms everybody into compliance with what has become the orthodoxy. And so what Inglis is suggesting here is that there's a discrepancy between the uh, Republican politicians' beliefs and what they're willing to publicly support, in part because the Republicans may misperceive the beliefs of other Republicans as being much more critical to climate policy uh, than they actually are. Internally, uh, many of them may believe, yeah, we got to do something about climate change. This is, this is affecting our environment. This is infecti affecting um, the way we're living. Um, but they don't feel as though they can share that belief. And this is what Leaf just described, uh, we observed in our data, um, that both sides are more receptive to the ideas of the other side than they think that their peers would be. And so this raises the question then of how to intervene uh, psychologically and structurally to try to correct these misperceptions. Right, so the result of our experiments, um, our interviews with, with politicians and just several decades of, of conducting research in, in social psychology and, and thinking about interventions really suggest two kind of broad strategies for, for intervening, for disrupting these kind of negative partisan reactions. The first one actually is, is nicely highlighted by another interview we conducted, this one with um, Representative uh, Mickey Edwards, who uh, was a Republican representative from, from Oklahoma. And we asked him how he thought people might respond to hearing about findings like ours, to hearing about this kind of updated information about the belief in climate change. Um, and, and he nicely captured um, what, what a lot of social psychological research suggests is, is an important reality and an important strategy. So he says, if people became more aware that this is not just a little circle of crazies on the left or on the right, but if people were more commonly seen that really Democrats and Republicans both kind of feel this way, I think that frees you up to not be worried about being an outlier. And he repeats, nobody wants to be an outlier, nobody. So this insight that we had this sense of being an outlier and this, this sense of being an outlier of our group is preventing us from expressing our beliefs is really a fundamental concern. We think a fundamental barrier to, to uh, increasing uh, bipartisan agreement with, with um, climate policy. And notice too that Mickey refers to being freed up if you understand what the patterns of belief actually are. And in fact, this is a, is a well-established intervention in a number of other domains. When people collectively misperceive what the collective believes, that is when we have these widespread beliefs that most people are opposed to ideas from the other side, it turns out that those collective misperceptions, this is something psychologists call pluralistic ignorance, can be easily dispelled, maybe I should say simply, if not easily, dispelled simply by giving people better information. So simply by telling people what it is that the average Republican actually believes and, and telling people what the average Democrat actually believes, conveying that people are actually willing to listen to the other side and are not going to respond in this kind of negative knee-jerk uh, fashion can dispel this kind of illusory perception, this pluralistic ignorance, and as Mickey said, can free people up to express their attitudes and beliefs without worrying about going against um, their political peers. So that's one broad intervention that is just really important to, to provide people with better information about what the distribution of beliefs actually are. And then David will describe this next intervention. Okay, so a, a second strategy is to recognize uh, that when people are threatened, when people feel threatened, that's when they're most defensive of their identities. So avoiding using culturally loaded language um, is one way of reducing this defensiveness. Uh, social psychology research suggests that referring to people as skeptics rather than deniers or referring to climate change rather than global warming, uh, these types of things can reduce the salience of partisan identities. 
But another approach, which is uh, suggested by decades of research on self-affirmation, uh, shows that when people are affirmed that they're basically good and moral, that when their values are recognized by others, they're more open to otherwise threatening information. So the New York Times article that I mentioned before had this example from uh, your work with the CCL, uh, where you met with a Republican congressional representative and to quote the article, expressed your appreciation for his services in Iraq and for his uh, being in the state Senate before mentioning anything about climate change. So what, and we use this in our academic article, this example, uh, because it nicely illustrates uh, this idea that meeting with someone and recognizing their values and their service um, prior to getting into anything about the potentially identity threatening information is, uh, is, is a valid uh, approach. And there's a rich scientific literature to back that up. The broader psychological point is that when people are affirmed that they're feel affirmed that they're seen as good and reasonable people, often when they have a chance to reflect upon their values or values that they share with someone who they're meeting with, then they're more open to evidence and less defensive of their identities. So why is this effective? Um, acknowledging that you have shared values yeah. and the worth and, and showing kind of the worth and respect that you have for others. Now note that this isn't just being nice to someone, but really affirming their values as a respected public servant, for example. So when people are affirmed in this way, they're more likely to take the bigger picture. Um, and when they see this bigger picture, when they take a broader perspective on things, then they're more able to listen to evidence that might otherwise be difficult to accept. And this idea, this seeing the big picture is what is really necessary when it comes to thinking about big and difficult issues like addressing climate change. Okay, so let me, um, I guess, wrap up by, by just kind of again, acknowledging our, um, deep thanks and, and appreciation for, for being part of, of this conversation. And, um, you know, again, David has noted a couple of times the parallels between the work you guys have done and, and the kind of psychological research literature. And, and really your approach illustrates um, what we refer to as a, as a psychologically wise type of intervention. That is an intervention that whether intentional or not, builds on a, on a kind of deep, understanding of how people work psychologically. And so one of the reasons why this is so exciting is that it, it seems for a long time now that, that these challenges of climate change and climate policy are not really technical challenges, right? They're really psychological and political challenges. And we very much appreciate the opportunity to um, talk to people who are engaging beyond broad scale surveys of uh, of the citizenry and really engaging in the political process. So thank you very much. Thank you. Wow, that was fantastic, gentlemen. Ricky, can we fit a question in? Do we have time to fit a question in, Ricky? Yeah, I think most of the questions have really just okay. been affirmation of their approach. And uh, yeah, not, not too many questions, just a lot of uh, nodding and agreement. If, if you can't do that through the chat, yeah. <laughs> Cool. Can we, if we, can we get cited as, as a co-author on one of your studies? We've never been published. <laughs> we're, 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 well, you know, that raises a, a, a point. We uh, shows our emails up there. Um, if you have examples that kind of resonate uh, with this, if you've had experiences um, where you've talked with congressional representatives, uh, where things along these lines kind of resonate or don't, um, you know, where, where, where things have been ineffective and you'd like to uh, share with us your um, experiences and your insights, uh, we'd be very interested in, in hearing about it and potentially following up with, uh, you know, talking on the phone as we have with uh, Mark and, and his organization uh, before. Yeah, great. We, we, we'll have a ton of stories that we want to send to you like that. I mean, one of my favorites was that we were in an office and, and I'll just say in the South, and um, our volunteers when the, it was supposed to be with the member but it was just staff and so they were talking about all the things they appreciated about the member who was actually hiding behind a little wall 
<laughs> and they said all the nice things. He came out and decided to join the meeting because he thought that we, we were going to come in and attack because we were like, quote, like environmentalists. So anyway, we'll feed you a bunch of those. And we'd love to have you back for just a straight Q&A session on another session. But um, thank you for your research. Thank you for being on the call, uh, making yourself available on a Saturday. And if you want to stay on for the next 10 or 12 minutes while we do the things we need to do to wrap up the call, you're welcome to. But uh, we understand everybody's uh, time is precious on the weekends also. So thank you so much, gentlemen. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Great. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So that was great. Um, so there's a few things that I want to go over um, that happened since last month's call. You know, I think usually people would kind of take August off and uh, say that's time where you finish up your vacation and relax and everything. But um, you all published 266 letters to the editor, 30 op-eds, and got 83 endorsements. And from our Google searches, it looks like we usually get about half of the letters to the editor reported based on our Google searches. So they're probably closer to four or 500 letters to the editor because they all don't get reported. And the other thing that you never know is who amplifies um, your voice. So for instance, we had our most recent op-ed uh, that has been picked up in 17 papers. And one of our regional coordinators was at a fundraiser in North Carolina that was hosted by the Sierra Club. And the speaker um, quoted from our op-ed multiple times. So you're also putting good information in the hands of other people who can go, go out and, um, and use that information. So again, thank you for just a really solid um, uh, month of, of August um, and doing really, really good work. I also want to mention that something ha is happening with our uh, business climate leaders. That's our biggest action team in all of CCL. And as part of the big uh, climate summit that uh, Governor Brown is hosting in California, they put together a half-day forum on the U.S. business case for a carbon tax. So for Harold, Steve, Bruce, and the rest of that team, fantastic work. That will also be streamed at carbontaxforum.com. So if you go to carbontaxforum.com uh, on uh, Thursday the 13th, you can follow that um, live stream. Okay, I want to talk about a little bit about what we're doing in um, Canada and the U.S. And you'll see the uh, Canadian actions on your action sheet. I think the most important thing is, is getting your meeting for our um, day on the Hill, our, our conference and going to the Parliament. So we're having another Canadian national conference. Getting your appointment with your MP is really important. And um, uh, please make sure that you are doing that. In terms of the U.S. side, there's really um, two things that we're working on. One is if you were at the conference in June, one of the things that had to be very obvious to you is, is how diverse the organization has, has become. And that's a good thing. But we want to continue to expand on that. And we would like CCL to look exactly like what the entire country, all the world's representing, um, uh, look like. And so one of the things we're asking you to do is to specifically target outreach in this month to expand the diversification of your um, chapter. The second thing is, is we want your chapter to organize itself for Congressional Education Day. So part of that's gonna mean getting your appointment set. Part of that's gonna mean figuring out who from your chapter can come. One of the things that we have this year that we've never had in the past is there's a stipend for new group leaders and liaisons that you can apply for uh, you'll see it in the frequently asked questions from our website. So we want to get, in particular, as many new um, and uh, group leaders and liaisons as possible. So that'll be happening over November 12th and 13th. On the 12th, to get prepared for what we'll be doing on the Hill on Tuesday, that day starts at 1.30. So you do need to be there from 1.30 until early in the evening to get ready for what we'll be doing on the Hill. But also, if you're able to be in D.C. on Monday morning the 12th, there is a really solid day of communication um, practices and tools for getting at communicating on climate change from a lot of different directions. So if it just does work out that you're able to be on the Hill um, for Monday morning, there'll be great tools um, available to you. Uh, also, we're keeping the price down to $79. Uh, one last time, um, we want to make it as accessible to as many people as possible. And then the other thing I want you to know about Congressional Education Day is if you've been to the conference in June the last two years, we'll be at the same hotel, the Omni, but we don't have the Regency Room, so we don't have 2,000 seats. We have the other side of the hotel. Some of you have been in the Blue Room, which holds about 700 people. 
So if you are able to make it with us in uh, November, um, register if you're coming. You don't want to be cut out because you, you forgot. Okay, last thing I want to share with you today is this. Um, we made a short film from the June conference, and what we wanted to do was follow what the volunteer experience is like. So this tracks three volunteers. It's short, it's only about five minutes, but I think it gives you a chance to share with people who've never come to what the conferences, what is the experience like for the volunteer? We have both experienced volunteers, we have first time volunteers. I hope you catch the gentleman who says, that he served in Vietnam and now he's volunteering with people who protested while he was serving um, and how poignant that is about us being able to reach across the aisle and work with people who've seen the world from different ways. So Ricky, could you please share that with everybody? My name is Princella Talley from Alexandria, Louisiana. I have not done anything political before at all. <laughs> People are really coming together and trying to address climate change, so I think we're here at the perfect time. I'd been volunteering in the public schools as a retired engineer. When I found out about CCL, I said this could make a difference. The conferences in June are a highlight of the year. It all pays off in immense reward. I came from San Antonio, Texas. I came to hang out with my baby girl here because her passions are now kind of becoming my passions too. I found out about CCL at Georgetown. I'm really excited to jump in and learn more about carbon fee and dividends and how to lobby and all that exciting stuff. The goal of this weekend is to let people see our experience so that they can know what we have to say really does matter. They're going to take us step by step how to successfully get support for our programs. They emphasize we have to step out of our comfort zones. I feel a little nervous, something I've never done before. I know that there's a lot to come, but at the same time, whatever happens, I know it'll be great, and I know I have a lot of support here. So far at the conference, I've learned that people in CCL are energized and they're not judging what you know and what you don't know. Everyone's just working towards something together. The conference has been going great. I've loved listening to all the speakers and the breakout sessions. This event is students working on their climate story and we go on the hill tomorrow to share with their member of Congress. Well, we're about two thirds of the way through the conference now and things are going extremely well. We do a lot of hard training where we have people play members of Congress that are likely to not be receptive to our message. We can be talking to a member of Congress that's at the opposite end of the political perspective. We have to find common grounds and work outward from that. There's a mindset of the powers that be, you know, will do things their way. And when it's time for something different, it's a lot of hesitation there. I uh, have been a conservative all my life, yet today I work with people who are very progressive. We all understand and are fighting for the same goal. So many people are talking about the answers and the good things we can all do together. I fought in the Vietnam War. I am working very closely now with people who were protesting the Vietnam War. It's just an incredible organization for bringing people together in a common cause. We all took our picture outside the Capitol and that was really cool to see the whole team, like 1,400 of us. It was a really good energy. It made me feel like we have a lot of power coming in because we're so united and we're so big. I'm feeling really stoked. My mom and I are constituents, so this is a really big meeting for us. I am nervous, but I have a good team. We know what we want to say. I just can't wait.
I have never engaged in any of this political activism. However, from seeing people of all ages so well versed and so passionate, I hope that I can help with the people around me that are people my age. From my youth, I always enjoyed being outdoors. My parents were able to introduce me to skiing and I'm enjoying teaching my grandkids now and I'd like to make the future for their grandkids as healthy as possible. To be such a newbie at this and appreciate it just for taking part, it's amazing. Do the work, show that you care about an issue and talk, have a conversation with your representatives.